Yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. So, and I also thank Christian again for your kind invitation to the source here. It is my great pleasure and yeah, honor. I, I feel honored to visit the source. It is a first visit for me. And so my visit was actually planned years ago, yeah, before the COVID-19 yeah, spread. Yeah. So then uh, Christian and I planned uh, this event <laughs> several years ago, but it's post, it was postponed, postponed by COVID-19. And uh, finally, I, came, I could come here and uh, meet you today. <laughs> so, so then also, uh, so for our uh, friendship, more than 30 years, yeah, so since, since uh, we were students in Vienna. So then I, I just retired my university, yeah, Tsukuba University this much. So then now I'm free, but uh, so my affiliation is, uh, so the Toyo Bunko, that is Oriental Library in Tokyo. So I'm a research fellow there. <laughs> so, so this lecture is entitled Patsapu Nimatak, uh, Nimatak's classification of Buddhist philosophical systems, the Svatantarika Prasangika distinction in 12th century Tibet. More exactly, I should say, 11th, 12th centuries in Tibet. So some of you may be familiar with the terms Svatantarika and Prasangika and the personal name Patsapu Nimatak, while some may not. So I will first explain you the terminology and review the history of our research on this subject. My purpose is to clarify and share with you the problems in studying the Tibetan classification of Indian philosophical systems. I'll also tell you how we scholars of Madhyamika philosophy have addressed these problems. I believe that we can learn lessons uh, for the future from our past research experiences. For your convenience, I will speak while showing you a slide uh, presentation. So please allow me to read the paper as I cannot give a free talk in English, so. Let's see. So the lecture will proceed with a discussion of the following issues. First, I'll introduce what the Svatantrika Prasanga distinction is and explain the terms Svatantrika and Prasangika, which are the supposed Sanskrit words for the Tibetan equivalents Rangipa and Telgirwa. Since they refer to the two divisions of the Indian Madhyamika tradition, we might well ask what interpretive difference divides the Madhyamika into the two. I will try to clarify this question by referring to the works of the Indian Madhyamika thinkers, Buddha Palita, Babi Beka, and Chandra Kirti. Second, I'd like to examine whether this distinction divides the Indian Madhyamika tradition into two branch schools, schools being largely influenced by the Tibetan doxographical tradition in, called Dukta, especially that of Gelupas. We modern scholars have tended to conceive that the schools called Svatantrika and Prasangika existed in India. But this is a misconception that the schools called Svatant, uh, sorry, misconception, some prudent scholars advised cautions. Third, later Tibetan scholars of the 14th and the 15th centuries also admitted that none of the Indian Madhyamika scholars mentioned, mentioned the Svatantrika Prasanka distinction. They generally attributed the distinction to the Tibetan Madhyamika exegete, Patsap Nimatak who lived in the last half of the 11th century to the first half of the 12th century. Our third question, therefore, is 
who puts up any matter quos. Also, biographical information about him is very limited. I will briefly present his career and works. Fourth, next, we need to confirm the authenticity of the works whose manuscripts were published under Patsap's name in 2006. I'm going to quote the comments of some scholars on this question. Fifth, on the assumption that the author of the works is Patsap, we will go one step further and examine his interpretation of the distinction between the Svatantrika and the Prasanka. In doing so, I'd like to draw your attention to his claim <coughs> that he himself is a Telgirwa, or Prasangika. I will then present uh, six, man, number six. I will uh, then present our solution to the question of whether Patsap was really the creator of the Svatantrika Prasangika distinction. So the seven, finally, we will look at the overall picture of Patsap's classification of the Indian philosophical systems, including the Buddhist and non-Buddhist systems. In the process, we will find out what Patsap intended to demonstrate and how he evaluated the Prasangika system he followed. So, okay. so first, what is the Svatantrika Prasangika distinction? This distinction is based on two different interpretations of Nagarjuna's logic that later interpreters consider to be implicit in his Mura Madhyamika Karika, the foundational treatise of the Madhyamika tradition of Mahayana Buddhism. The Mura Madhyamika Karika was composed in verse in which the author Nagarjuna expressed his thoughts very succinctly. For example, the famous first verse of the first chapter reads, you see here, so not arising from self, nor from other, nor from both or with, without a cause, do anything, any things exist anywhere. So the translation, the translation is adopted from MacDonald 2015. So here, Nagarjuna negates four possible ways of arising without a given reason for each negation. Why is it impossible that things come into being from the self, from the other, from both, or without a cause? It was the task of the commentators to give a reason for each negation and to make the statement logically tenable. So, the Svatantrika is a Sanskrit word assumed from the Tibetan term Rangipa, which refers both to the interpretation that Nangarjuna's verse statements entail a logic in the form of independent inference. It is called Svatantra Anumana in Sanskrit and Rangyujepak in Tibetan. And to the person who holds this interpretation, Prasangika is a Sanskrit word assumed from the Tibetan term Terugirwa, which refers uh, both to the interpretation that Nagarjuna's verse statements entail a ro logic in, in the form of a consequence, that is Prasanga or Tergil, and to the person who holds this interpretation. We also use the terms more broadly to refer to a system, meaning the set of ideas of the respective positions. So please keep it in mind that these are the Sanskrit words that are assumed from the Tibetan words, Rangyupa and Telgirwa. So this means that the Sanskrit words are not attested in Indian literature. Nevertheless, they are well established and widely used by scholars. So I will use them here too, but I will also introduce the problem lurking in the use of these terms. 
So let's return to Nagarjuna's verse and see what kind of logic independent inference and consequence are. I'll take the negation of arising from other as an example. It seemed reasonable to think that things are produced, uh, not, not reasonable to think that the things are produced from themselves or from both themselves and the others or without cause. It appears, however, reasonable to conceive that things arise from other things as smoke arises from fire. Nevertheless, Nagarjuna dismisses this possibility. Why? Commentators explain the reason for this dismissal as follows. So first, Buddha Parita. So Buddha Parita from the fifth and fifth, fifth, sixth centuries uh, proposes that things do not arise from other things because of the consequence that everything would arise from everything. That is to say, if one accepts the premise that a thing arises from another thing, the absolute consequence follows that everything would arise from everything. Because everything is mutually other and distinct. So it is absurd since, in reality, a sprout cannot arise from a stone, even though they are mutually distinct. This argument is intended to refute the opponent by drawing an un unaccept unacceptable consequence from his assertion that a thing arises from another thing. This is a type of argument known as prasanga, so consequence. The subsequent commentator, Bhaviveka, so next one. So Bhaviveka, <coughs> who lived in the seventh, uh, sixth century, was critical of Buddha Parita's argument because it lacks a formal logical structure with a reason and an example. At the time of Bhaviveka, the inferential proof comprising a thesis, reason, and example became popular since the Buddhist logician Dignaga proposed it. In accordance with the Dignaga's standard formal proof, Bhaviveka considered Buddha Parita's argument to be incomplete because Buddha Parita did not give a reason, an example, that could not be replaced by a consequence. Drawing a consequence was not considered by logicians to be a valid logical method of proof. Babibeka himself proposes a formal inferential proof that things do not arise from their conditions, conditions as the same as uh, cause, né? because things and their conditions are mutually other. For example, a pot does not arise from the conditions that are other than the pot. You can see his original sentences on the slide here, which appears quite complex, so complicated. But his point is simple. Two mutually other things cannot have a causal relationship because they are distinct and have nothing to do with each other. But Vivek presents his argument in the form of an inference, an mana, which consists of a thesis, reason, and example. So in the seventh century, another commentator, Chandra Kirti, criticized the Bhaviveka and defended Buddha Parita's argument. Chandrakirti proposed a similar prasang type argument to that of Buddha Parita. If things arise from other things, it follows that there would be the birth of everything from everything, because being other is the same for every non-producer, namely, the absurd consequence follows that a stone would produce a sprout. 
The point is identical to that put forth by Buddha Parita. So what were the reasons behind Chandrakirti's rejection of Babiveka's inferential proof and the preference of a Prasanga type argument? Chandrakirti designated Babiveka's proof as independent inference, Svatantaranumana, which denotes an inference formulated independently by a Madhyamika proponent based on his own assertion, as opposed to the Prasanga, which depends on the opponent's assertion. Chandrakirti considers this Bhaviveka's approach inappropriate for Madhyamika debaters, as they do not accept the subject of the thesis, the reason, or the example as a real entity. Rather, they regard them unreal and empty, shunya. This Madhyamika's position contravenes the logical tenet of Dignaga, according to which the items in question must be established and existent for both parties engaged in the debate. Therefore, according to Chandra Kyoti, Babiveka's inferential proof cannot be employed in the debate with those who accept real existence. Should Babiveka accept the Madhyamika principle of emptiness? In contrast, Babiveka proposed that the problem could be resolved by limiting the application of the inference to the sphere of conventions. Madhyamikas may accept the conventional usage of inference, yet they must abandon it on the ultimate level of emptiness. So I will stop, uh, I will, uh, stop further elaboration on the Bhaviveka Chandrakirti conflict and its associated logic. These are the issues that have been discussed by numerous scholars and remain contentious. For the purpose of our discussion, it is important to confirm that the Svatantrika Prasanka distinction pertains to the divergent positions of Bhaviveka and Chandrakirti. Bhaviveka maintains that Nangarjuna's statements can be reformulated into an inference that proves his own assertion. Whereas Chandrakirti maintains that Nagarjuna only intended to negate his opponent's assertion by drawing an unacceptable consequence for the opponent. This is because Madhyamikas may not use an inference whose components are not existent for themselves. This different position and their proponents are designated by Tibetans as Rangipa and Telgirwa. Modern scholarship has proposed that the Sanskrit equivalents are Svatantrika and Prasangika. The term Svatantrika, as previously discussed, can be interpreted as either the position or the individual who employs independent inference. Similarly, the term prasangika can be understood to refer either to the position or the individual who uses prasanga argument. However, being influenced by Tibetan sources, we expanded the meaning of these terms and imagined as if the Madhyamka tradition split up into two parties or schools in India. In other words, we nearly accepted that there existed two Madhyamika schools called Svatantrika and Prasangika. At the same time, we also realized that it is an illusion. Let's see this question. So does the Svatantrika Prasangika distinction divide the Indian Madhyamika tradition into the two branch schools? In the introduction of his book, A Study of Svatantrika, eminent scholar of Tibetology, Donald Lopez, wrote in 1987 as follows. So you see here. So quote, 
Chandrakirti is held to be the founder of the Prasangika school. Similarly, Vabiveka is considered to be the founder of the Svatantrika school. In the 8th century, the great scholar Shantarakrishna founded a school that su supported the general Svat Svatantrika position, but disagreed with Vabiveka on a number of important points. Because Shantarakrishna's school incorporated certain doctrines of the Yogacara system, it is known as Yogacara Svatantrika Madhyamka, whereas Vabiveka's school is known as Sautrantika Svatantrika Madhyamka. Unquote. So here the author employs the following terms and phrases the Svatantrika school, the Prasangika school, the founder of the school, and founded the school of, etc. The concept is primarily derived from the Tibetan doxographical literature known as Dupta, which attracted significant attention from modern scholars during the 1970s and 80s. As a consequence of the Chinese communist invasion of Tibet in 1959, numerous Tibetan intellectuals were compelled to leave their country. They took with them a wealth of Tibetan Buddhist literature, which they subsequently disseminated throughout the world. Scholars from outside of Tibet also had opportunity to engage in direct learning with the Tibetan monk scholars, with those of the Gelupa tradition in particular. So American scholars, such as Roberts and Klein and Jeffrey Hopkins, published the translation of the texts along with the studies on the classification of Buddhist systems based on the Dupta literature of Geluk scholars. So, for example, Jaman Shepa, Chankya Rupe Duzhe, as you see on the screen. The study of the Dupta also flourished in Europe and Japan. So, during my graduate studies in 1980s, we had the opportunity to read Chankya's Dupta in a class, which proved to be a highly enlightening experience. It was fascinating, and I learned a lot from the reading, not being aware of the problems following the Tibetan classification. So, the following will provide a brief explanation of what the dupta is. The term dupta, which corresponds to the Sanskrit word siddhanta, can be translated as, as either the ultimate of established systems or systems established and ultimate. In the context of Tibetan Buddhist tradition, Dupta is understood to be an exeg exegetical treatise that classifies various philosoph philosophical thoughts, critical, critically analyzes their contents, and occasionally imposes a ranking among them. The Tibetan doxographical text emulated the style of Saminya Mahayana treatises, such as Shantarakshita's Tattva Sangraha. However, it was the Tibetans who fully developed this genre of literature. Since they imported a substantial corpse of Buddhist scriptures and treatises into the region, in a relatively brief period of time, it was necessary for them to organize them according to their content of the teachings. In the ninth century, during the reign of the Tibetan Empire, so several uh, pre uh, precursors to the genre were composed. So here you are. So known, uh, known by the title Classification of Views, so Tawe Kepal. These were authored by the imperial translator Yeshede and others. In the 11th century, the Nima scholar Ronsom Chukisampo uh, left two detailed notes on views, 
one of which bears the name Lupta. At this time, the divisions of Svatantrika and Prasangika had not yet emerged. The two divisions appeared in the 15th, uh, 14th century Dupta work by the Sakyaskara Uparoso and subsequently became popular in Geruk Dupta works, uh, such as the Duptas by German Shepa, uh, Shepa Ngawansundu, his lineage including Chankyal Rupe Doje, Kunju Jigme Wampo, and Tukan Ropsan Chukinima from the 17th to 18th centuries. These Geruk scholars adhered to the Marihemka interpretation established by the Geruk founder Tsongkapa and his successors Kedupje and Gyalsop Dharmalinchen, which distinguishes between the Svatantrika and Prasangika positions. In the uh, 1980s, when we were deeply engaged in the study of these Dupta texts, we approached the development of Buddhist philosophy in India through the lens of the Tibetan Duptas, as illustrated on the following slide. So the Buddhist philosophical system is divided into four principal uh, streams. So, by, uh, so first is the Vaivasika or Savastivada, and the Satrantika here which are assigned to the vehicle of Hira, so Shravakayana, and the Yogacara and the Madhyamaka are classified as great vehicle or Mahayana. Of these, the Sarvastivada followers established monastic orders in accordance with their own pre precepts, the so Vinaya, whereas the Svatantrika is known as a certain theoretical position, but the advocates of the Satrantika position did not establish any scholastic institution. The Yogacara system can be described as a set of practices and theories, including the mind-only theory, so Vinyapti Matra or Chit Matra, which originated with Asanga and Basvandu. The Madhyamika system is founded upon Nagarjuna's teachings of emptiness and the middle way. This system was subsequently developed by interpreters of Nagarjuna's works, including Buddha Parita, Bhaviveka, and Chandrakirti. According to the Tibetan Dupta classification after the 14th century, the Madhyamika system is divided into two, Svatantrika and Prasangika. The Svatantrika is further divided, divided into two subdivisions. So here you are. So, Svata, uh, so which are the Svatantrika Madhyamika and the Yogacara Madhyamika. So in the past, we used to be accustomed to calling each one school. This is effective to the extent that the term school simply refers to a group of Indian scholars who share the same philosophical position. However, the Indian philosophers themselves were not concerned about their affiliation with a particular school. Rather, they thought themselves as adherents to a particular doctrine or position. So in his uh, 1988 book, Indian Ways of Thinking, the original of which is written in Japanese, the Japanese scholar of Indian and Buddhist philosophy, Hajime Nakamura, observed as follows. So, here we are. So, quote, in India, since ancient times, there has been no such expression as school or sect in the Sanskrit language. Western and Japanese writers on the history of Indian philosophy often use such expressions, but these are nothing more than the Western or Japanese thought brought to India. For example, proponents of, uh, of non dual represent, uh, represented by Shankara, are expressed with the plural form of Advaitin or Advaitvadin. 
This means that they are those who hold to the philosophy of non-dual monism. The unit is the individual, and the terms Advaita and Advaita Vada refer to a particular theory, which is always abstract, and its social and collective aspects are largely disregarded." Unquote. Nakamura presents the case of Vedanta philosopher Shankara and his tenet of non-dual monism as a relevant example. However, the point is also applicable to Buddhism. In India, in contrast to Tibet, there was a no monastery-based organization with economic and social ties that also shared doctor doctrinal teachings. The Indian early Buddhist monastic communities were structured according to a system of precepts, so Vinaya. So may I back, go back. <coughs> the structure of Indian monastic communities is an important and complex topic. So in this talk, I will limit my discussion to the divisions of Svatantrika and Prasangika. So it is challenging to categorize them as schools, given that we have only three masters, Bhaviveka, Shantarakrishna, and Kamalashira, as the members of the Svatantrika school, and only two, Buddha Parita and Chandrakirti, for the Prasangika school. The Tibetans added Shantideva to the Prasangika lineage. But Shantideva did not share the use of Prasangika argument with the two predecessors. In a strict sense, Shantideva is not a Prasangika thinker. So in conclusion, it is essential to consider the historical context in which these masters lived. Actually, they lived centuries apart without direct contact. Their relationship was not one of a master and a disciple, ex <coughs> except for Shantarakrishna and Kamalashira. Moreover, as previously, previously stated, none of these Indian scholars self-identified as Svatantrika or Prasangika, and the Sanskrit words Svatantrika and Prasangika are not attested in Indian literature. These scholars offered different interpretations of Nangarjuna's Mula Madhyamika Karika, yet they did not intend <coughs> to split the Madhyamika tradition into two or more. The terms Rangyupa and Telgyulva are to be understood as referring to a system, position, or interpretation rather than a school. If it is intended to refer to an individual, it signifies the advocate. So that is vadin in Sanskrit. So advocate, advocate of a specific system, position, or interpretation. Next. In fact, the academic community began to exercise caution regarding the use of the Tibetan doxographical classification of Indian thought, thought and initiated a discourse on the Tvatantrika Prasangika distinction. George Dreyfus and Sarah McClintock were responsible for editing the book, The Tvatantrika Prasangika Distinction, What Difference Does and Difference Make? In 2003, the book published nine contributions including one of mine. This book represents an attempt to subject this doxographical distinction to closer scrutiny. The editors urge readers to reflect on the careless reference to the Svatantrika philosophy and Prasangika philosophy, which, which they suggest are often taken as self-evident and unproblematic. In their introduction, they make the following observation. So here you are. Quote, the late and re uh, retrospective nature of the Svatantrika Prasanka distinction, as well as its apparent non-Indian provenance, together signal 
its unusual status as a doxographical category that should render us cautious about its use in the interpretation of Indian material. By themselves, however, these qualities do not warrant rejection of the distinction. The mere fact that the Indian authors themselves were not cognizant of being Svatantrika and Prasangika, and that it is only later Tibetan ex exegetes who thought of them as such, is not enough to disqualify these descriptions." Unquote. So the editor's stance on the Svatantrika Prasangika distinction is entirely accept ac acceptable. So I think it's very reasonable. Any classification in, in Tibetan doctrinal uh, literature must be understood as a humanoidical device that brings order to a variety of individual, individual texts, ideas, and thinkers. While the Tibetan classification undoubtedly facilitates our comprehension of Buddhist philosophy, we should be cautious about its, its use. For, as the editors state, its Indian provenance is unlikely. The Tibetan tradition has also acknowledged this assessment and attributed the Svatantrika Prasanka distinction to Patsap Nimatak. Patsap was a Madhyamka scholar and translator who was born in the mid 11th century and died in the mid 12th century. At the time of the book's publication in 2003, Patsap's works were not known to us. We had to presume that they had been lost. But in 2006, uh, we are fortunate to discover that they had survived. The publication of the collection of the works of Kadampa scholars, so Kadam Sumbum, from Chengdu in 2006, enabled us to gain access to them. Kadampa is, the, is a general term for early Tibetan scholars in the 11th to 13th centuries. This collection is to, said to have been a private collection of the fifth Dalai Lama preserved at the Daipum Monastery. So then who was Patsap Nimatak? According to the Buru Annals and other Tibetan historical texts, he was born in the Penyul district, situated in the northern region of Lhasa around 1055. In his youth, he was dispatched to Kashmir on a mission to procure Buddhist treatises for translation. It is reported that he spent 23 years, presumably between uh, 1077 and 1100, in Kashmir. There, Patsap studied Nagarjuna's Madhimika philosophy with the Kashmiri scholar Mahasmati and his teacher Parahitubadara, primarily based on Chandragirti's interpretation. Patsap revised the early Tibetan translation of Nagarja's Mula Madhyam Karika and translated Chandrakirti's commentary, the Prasanapada, with the assistance of Mahasmati. In addition to translating numerous other works, Patap composed com commentarial works on the Mula Madhyam Karika, the Prasanapada, and Arya Deva's Chatushataka, as well as a brief work on the relationship between the chapters of the Mura Madhyamaka Karika. So manuscripts, but the manuscripts of these four works are included in the collection of Kadampa scholars, volume 11. During his studies in Kashmir under the reign of the King Harusha, <coughs> cultural and intellectual pursuits flourished in the region. However, the king was assassinated in a violent in 1101. It was probably during this period that Patsap fled from Kashmir and returned to his home in Penyu, 
where he, he is said to have resided, continued his translation work, and taught Tibetan students. In any case, we are gratified to gain access to his works. However, our first task as scholars was to determine if the four works are indeed the genuine compositions of Patsapani Matak. So the next is authorship of the works attributed to Patsap. Upon initial examination of the manuscript, there was some uncertainty regarding the authorship. As evidenced by the slide, here is the manuscript, first page, now the title page. So the title page of the bundle of the manuscript reads, a Madhyamika commentary composed by Chandra Kirti, in the first line. Uh, sorry, it's too small to read. But in the second line, uh, it says, this was not composed by Chandra Kirti, but by the translator Patsap. One may reasonably conclude that the information in the first line was erroneously given and subsequently corrected by another individual in the second line. However, how can we ascertain that it is the bundle of Patsap's work, works? As the definitive proof of authorship is lacking, it is reasonable to assume that it was indeed Patsap's. In their 2009 article, Patsap and the Origin of the Prasangika, George Dreyfus and the uh, Tondop Tsering posed this question. The authors concluded that the four works were highly likely composed by Patsap himself or a person very close to him for the following reasons. The manuscript is of an antiquated nature, exhibiting archaic orthography and the, uh, that may date back to the 12th century. The text confirms that it was originally written in Tibetan rather than translated from the Sanskrit. The colophon of the two texts, so the Arya Devas Chat Shataka and a commentary on the Arya Devas Chat Shataka and note on the relationship between the chapters of the Mura Mariam Karika, attribute the authorship to Patsap. So the colophon, colophons of uh, the other two texts gives, uh, give us more interesting information. The colophon of the commentary on Nagarjan's Mura Madhyamika Karika reads, this is a record of the exposition of Pandit Hasmati. Hasmati is equal with Mahasmati, so Patsap's teacher. Hmm? Dreyfus and Tsering expressed their impression as follows. Who else but Patsap himself could lay down the views of his collaborator Mahasmati? In fact, this work seems to have been written on the basis of oral instructions from an Indian scholar because the author uses Sanskrit words without translating them into the Tibetan language. For example, uh, the author wrote Buddha, that is Buddha, body, that is body, and Ede, Ede is uh, Adi in Sanskrit, so meaning is etc. This is a remarkable feature of the work. I assume that the record of Mahasmati's oral instructions had been written down in Kashmir before Patsap began his translation work. He first studied Mudda Mura Madhimika Karika under Mahasmati's guidance in preparation for translating Chandrakirti's commentary. The colophon of Patsap's uh, commentary on Chandrakirti's Prasanna Pada, uh, entitled Explanation of Difficult Points in Chandrakirti's Prasanna Pada, states, this was written in dependence upon the instruction of the Lama Pandit Merchant. Who the Lama Pandit Merchant is remains a mystery. It could be 
another of Patsap's collaborators, Kanaka Varman, with whom Patsap worked on the retranslation of the Prasannapada after his return to Tibet. Since this commentary was most likely composed in Tibet for the purpose of teaching Tibetan students. Compared to the commentary on the uh, Muramadim Kakarika, the wording of this commentary is Tibetanized. The collaborator Kanaka Barman had a long career as a translator working with Rinja Sampo and other Tibetan scholars. It is perhaps not surprising that an Indian scholar would be a traveler, a, tra a tradesman, and earn money through translation. He could be called a teacher, scholar, trader. So there is textual evidence for Patsap's authorship of this work. The author states that he has two manuscripts of the Prasanapada, a Kashmiri manuscript and kind of, uh, an Indian manuscript, and points out a slight difference between the two, manuscript, two manuscripts, which are most likely identical to the manuscripts that Patsapi used with Mahasmati and Kanaka Varman, respectively, to translate the Prasanapada. According to the colophon of the Tibetan translation of the Prasanapada, Patsap revised his earlier translation, which he did with Mahasmat in Kashmir, later with Kanaka Varman in Lhasa, because they obtained the second manuscript from the eastern borderland, which probably refers to eastern India or Bengal. Who else but the translator Patsap Nimatak? was in a position to look at the two manuscripts and point out the difference between their readings. I discussed this issue in my 2006 article, Transmission uh, of the Muramadiyam Gakarik and the Prasan Pada to Tibet from Kashmir. Thus, we have concluded that Patsap's authorship of the four works cannot be denied. So the next is Patsap as a self-proclaimed prasangika. So let's return to our main topic, the Svatantarika uh, prasangika distinction. In his commentary on the Muramalimeka Karika, the Umatsawe Sherapkitika, Patsap uses both the terms Rangipa and Telgirwa and defines them respectively as follows. Rangipa is the Marhyamika exegete who interprets Nagarjuna's statements as implying logic of independent, uh, independent inference. They are Bhavi Vega, Shantarakrishta, and Kamarashila. Although Shantarakrishta and Kamarashila did not write a commentary on the Muramadhyamika Karika, they agreed to use independent inference to prove the emptiness of all phenomena. So that they are called Rangyupa. Telgirwa is the Madhyamik exegete who interprets Nagarjuna's statements as implying the logic of prasanga type argument. They are Buddha Balita, Chandra Kirti, and Patsap himself. Patsap claims to be a Telgirwa, saying, Nye Telgirwa. So in English, I Telgirwa. To my knowledge, he is the only one among Indian and Tibetan Marihima scholars who has made such a claim. Indian Marihima masters did not make this distinction, as we have previously seen. Later Tibetan thought that the distinction applied only to Indian masters. Most of Geluk scholars would agree that they were the followers of Chandrakirti's Prasangika position, but I have not encountered the claim, I am a Telgirwa in their uh, works. If you, you know something, please tell me. So Patsap is unique on this point. Otherwise, his understanding of a Svatandrika Prasanka distinction is not different from our uh, understanding which is based on the difference in the logical solution of Nagarjuna's statement between Bhavi Beka and Chandra Kirti. 
PASAP also uses the terms Rangyupa and Telgirwa to refer to their respective interpretation, interpretations or systems. So the next question is, uh, did PASAP create the Svatandrika Prasanka distinction? Is it really his creation? Modern scholars have tried to answer this question by exploring his historical background. First of all, we have to pay attention to the fact that his commentary on the Mura Mariam Gakarika, in which he introduces the Vatantarika Prasanka distinction, is said to have been written under the guidance of his collaborator and teacher, Mahasmati. Accordingly, Dreyfus and Tserin suggested the following. You see here, quote, if we believe it is colophon to the commenter on the Muramarimika Karika and it is attribution of authorship, this suggests that the Suvatantrika Prasanka distinction was not created by Patsap as many informed scholars, both traditional and modern, have assumed, but pre-existed in India and that Patsak recorded, clarified, in, and intensified a distinction that was already made by some late Indian scholars." Unquote. Uh, in my conjecture, so quote, due, to, uh, due to this commentary being a record of his Kashmiri teacher and co-translator Mahasmati's uh, explanation, they may have shared the self-identification as a prasangika. So Kevin Voss, in his forthcoming book, which deals with this very issue, also states as follows, quote, if we take Patsapa to his word, at least some Kashmiri scholars made a Svatantrika prasangika distinction, unquote. All Afghans agree that Mahasmati or some of his colleagues in Kashmir made this, this distinction. This is, a this is a natural and reasonable assumption because, as noted above, Patsap's commentary reflects the oral instructions of an Indian teacher. Moreover, in the Kashmiri academic circle, where Patsap studied Nagarjuna's Muramadim Gakarika and its Indian commentaries. The theoretical conflict between Bhaviveka and Chandrakirti over Nagarjuna's root text could be a, a highlight of a scholarly discussion. So you see, anyone, including us modern scholars who studies Chandra gives this Prasanna Pada and learns about the controversy between Bhaviveka and Chandra Kirti can understand that they had different views. In Kashmir or elsewhere, those who learned it could easily distinguish between the two positions, whatever they called them. In fact, some other followers of Chandra Kirti who lived a little after Patsap distinguished Chandra Kirti's position from that of Babiveka. A Kashmir scholar, Jayananda, calls Babiveka Rangipa, and the uh, anonymous author of the commentary on Chandra Kirti's Prasannapada from Vikramashira Monastery in Northern India also calls Babiveka Suvatantra Sadhana Padin, which means the advocate of independent inferential proof. It was a trend in 11th, 12th century India to study the works of Chandrakirti. Patsap imported this trend to Tibet. So finally, I'd like to present the overall picture of how Patsap classified philosophical systems. As the chart on the slide shows, he takes the four mainstreams, so he, uh, by, uh, by Bashko, uh, Savastivada, Satrantika, Yogacara, and Madhyamaka as Buddhist scholastic systems. 
His concern, however, is not with the theoretical controversies between these systems, but rather with controversies between the substantialist, Sungwe Purumawa, and Madhyamaka systems, and also between the Subatantric and Prasangika systems. So substantialist, so we usually translate it uh, by substantialist, Sungwe Purumawa, include non-Buddhist philosophers in addition to Vaibhashika, uh, Sautrantika, and Yogacara followers. So namely, all except Madhyamikas. So then, uh, here you are, what's here? Substantialists include non-Buddhist and all other, uh, all Vaibhashikas, Sautrantikas, Yogacaras. So except Madhyamika. So, according to Patsap, only Madhyamikas are free from the substantialistic view because they maintain that all things are empty and lacking in substantial entity. In short, Patsap divides all systems into three parties the substantialist, the Rangyupa, and the Telgirwa. According to Patsapa, the disputes between the three parties proceed as follows. The first, the substantialist introduce an objection to Madhyamika's proof of absence of the uh, intrinsic nature, that is emptiness of all things. Second, the Svatantrika Madhyamikas respond to this objection with their own assertion that all things are empty. Third, Chandrakit gives a refutation in response to the thought of those who hold the Svatantrika position. <coughs> Fourth, Chandrakit demonstrates the establishment of his own position that the intention of the teacher Nagarjuna is none other than the Prasenka position. The first substantialist claim points out that the absence of intrinsic nature or the emptiness of all things cannot be proved by words, scriptures, direct perception, or inferential reasoning. Patsap apparently adopted this argument from Kamala Shira's Mariamika treatise entitled, uh, entitled Mariamika Aloka that is, elimination of the middle. <coughs> also from Shantara Kushtas Mariamika that is, ornament of the middle. Pasap borrows the refutation of the substantialist views of the non-Buddhist Jaina and the Vaisheshika, as well as of the Buddhist Vaibhashika, Sauturantika, and the Yogacara. The second Svatantrika response to the substantialist is taken from Kamala Shira, who argues that the absence of intrinsic nature and emptiness of all things can be proved by means of inference. Based on the logical reason of being <coughs> sorry. Sorry, where am I? <clears throat> so the Kamalashira who argued that the absence of intrinsic nature and emptiness of all things can be proved by means of inference based on the logical reason being neither one nor many. So the uh, reason of being neither one nor, uh, one nor many is uh, called in Tibetan, Chiktan, Judelgi, Tensik, in Sanskrit, Eka, Aneka, Vyoga, Hetu. This logical reason is used by Shantara Krishna and Kamala Shira, the beginning, uh, of, uh, beginning of Shantara Krishna's Madhyam Galankara and Kamala Shira's commentary on it. To say that the entities postulated as real by Buddhist and non-Buddhist substantialists have no intrinsic nature because they are neither of a single nature nor of a multiple nature, like a reflection. 
the premise <coughs> is that whatever exists in is either of a single nature or of a multiple nature. This statement constitutes an inferential proof, which, according to Chipatsap, is an independent inference. So, Rangyo Chepak. In this way, on the one hand, Patsap uses the arguments of his rival, Svatantric masters, Shantara Krishna and Kamarashira, to dismiss the substantialist objection. On the other hand, he appeals to Chantra Kirti to discredit their use of independent inference from the Prasangika point of view. The third argument represents Chandra Kirti's refutation of Babivega's use of independent inference, and the fourth expresses the Prasangika position that Nangarjuna intended to use only Prasanga type arguments, not independent inference. So here, it is evident that Patsap replaces the theoretical conflict between Babibek and Chandrakirti with the conflict between Shantar Krishna Kamalashira and Chandrakirti. Historically speaking, however, it is anachronistic and impossible for Chandrakirti, who is said to have lived in the 7th century, to have responded to Shantar Krishna and Kamalashira who lived in the 8th century. Rather, it should be understood that it was Patsap himself who criticized Shantara Krishna and Kamalashila from his own prasangika position. In the final stage, he dis demonstrates the superiority of his own prasangika system over that of the Svatantrika. So Patsap challenged Chandrakita himself, against the great Svatantrika masters, Shantara Krishna and Kamalashila, and sought to surpass them in order to spread the Prasanga view of Chandrakirti in Tibet. Thus, for Patsap, the Svatantrika Prasanga distinction was not a retrospective event that took place in India in the uh, sixth or seventh centuries, but Rather, it was an ongoing event in which he himself self participated in Kashmir and Tibet in the 11th, 12th centuries. He participated in that as a new Prasangika interpreter of Madhyamka philosophy, updating the system from his own perspective to make it a superior Madhyamika system to all others. His classification of these systems was passed down to later generations and was largely accepted by Geluk scholars in particular. As I have mentioned at the beginning of this talk, later Tibetans recognized that the distinction between Subhatantrika and Prasangika was based on the different interpretations of the logic implicit in Nagarjuna's statements among the commentators of the Mura Madhyamika Karika, Buddha Balita, Babi Bega, and Chandra Kirti. Although Keruk scholars such as Tsongkhapa extended the distinction to the different ontological theories. Patsap's activities, including the translation of Chandra Kirti's works and his own compositions uh, on Prasanka system, undoubtedly led to the uh, subsequent rise of Prasangika philosophy in Tibet. Curiously, however, we rarely find a citation of his words in later writings. Not only Patsaps, but also his contemporary productions had only limited use by later Tibetans. This suggests that the large number of works became for some reason, inaccessible as early as the 15th century, before, before the time of the fifth Dalai Lama, who kept them as his, his private collection, until they were brought to our attention by the newly published collection of the Kadampa scholars. This may also be because later Tibetans lost interest in the achievement of their early predecessors. In this respect, the influence of Patsap's work, works on later Tibetan uh, Buddhist scholarship 
was limited. But his spiritual influence as introducer of the Prasanka system was highly appreciated. The later acceptance of Pazap's thought by Gerupas and other scholars will be the subject of our investigation in the future. It also remains unclear why Pazap uses the terms Ragyupa and Telgirua only in his commentary on the Mulamarimika Karika, but not in his commentary on the Prasanapada, where he refers to Chandrakirti's criticism of Babivega's use of independent inference. The instruction of his teacher Mahasamadhi and the academic circumstances of Kashmir may account for his enthusiasm for distinguishing his favorite Prasangika from, from the Svadantrika. After his return to Tibet, he may have been more cautious in writing the commentary on the Prasanapada for his disciples, assumably because Tibetans held Shantarakrishna the Kamarashira, who first introduced the Madhyangba doctrine into Tibet in high esteem. If he distinguished between the Svatantrika and the Prasanga positions and criticized the Babileka, this criticism could also be directed at the other Svatantrika masters, Shantarakrishna and Kamarashila. This could cause offense to other Tibetans. So now it's time to conclude my talk. So we have reviewed our research on, on the Svatantrika Prasanga distinction and how we have approached the Tibetan classification of Buddhist philosophical systems, including this distinction. So first, I presented what the Svatantrika Prasangika distinction is and explained the terms Svatantrika and Prasangika, which are the support Sanskrit words of their Tibetan equivalents, Ragyapa and Telgirwa, respectively. We have confirmed that it is based on two different uh, interpretations of the logic implicit in Nagarjuna's statements. In fact, the commentators, Buddhapalita, Bhavibek, and Chandra Kirti, analyzed Nag Nagarjuna's statements differently. Bhavibek reduced it to an inferential proof, whereas Buddhapalita and Chandra Kirti proposed to interpret it as a prasanga type argument. Chandrakirti criticized Babiveka for his use of the independent inference. Their controversy is considered, to, uh, considered by later Tibetan scholars to have split the Marimeka tradition into two divisions, Babiveka's Ragyupa and Chandrakirti's Terugirwa, that is, the Svatantrik and Prasakika. Although these Sanskrit words are not attested in Indian literature. Second, I pointed out that uh, our research on the Svatantrika Prasanka distinction in the 1970s and 80s was largely influenced by the Tibetan doxographical literature called the Dupta, especially that of Gelupas. The Dupta texts, on the one hand, greatly facilitated our, our understanding of the Buddhist philosophical <laughs> systems but on the other hand, set a trap for the misconception that the schools called Svatantrika and Prasangika were established in India, splitting the Madhyamika tradition into the two. Some scholars have advised caution in using such terms as school and sect for the divisions, since none of the Indian Madhyamika thinkers claim to belong to any such school. As most Tibetan and modern Madhyamika interpreters suspected, the Svatantrika Prasanka distinction was not of Indian origin, but rather a Tibetan creation, more specifically the creation of Patsapa Nimatak, who lived in the last half of the 11th century to the first half of the 12th century. Third, before examining the question of whether Patsap actually created the distinction, we reviewed his life and works, as the biographical information about him is very limited. 
He's said to have studied in Kashmir for 23 years and to have translated many Buddhist texts into Tibetan, Tibetan including Chandrakirti's Madhimeka treatises. He also composed commentaries on the Mula Madhimeka Karika and Chandrakirti's Prasanapada, along with a few other minor works. Fourth, we also confirm Patsap's authorship of these works. George Dreyfus, Tondrup Sherin, and I looked into this question and assumed that these works were written by Patsap himself. On this assumption, we began to examine his interpretation of the dis distinction between the Svatantrika and the Prasankika. Fifth, we have noted his claim to be a Telgurua or Prasankika. He clearly distinguishes between the Svatantrika and the Prasankika positions, identifying Bhavivega, Shantarakusha, and Kamarashira as Rangipa, and Buddha Parita, Chandrakete, and himself as Telgurua. His definition of the two divisions seems to correspond to the later understanding that the Svatantrika refers to the Madhyamika exegete who interprets the statements of Nagarjuna to imply the logic of independent inference. And the Prasangika refers to the Madhyamika exegete who interprets the statements of Nagarjuna to imply the logic of Prasanga type argument. The systems are also referred to as the Ragyupa and the Telugurua, respectively. Sixth, we have addressed our original question. Did Patsap create the Svatatrika Prasanga distinction? Scholars who have examined this question agree that the distinction was made in the, uh, in the Buddhist intellectual circle in Kashmir, where teachers and students studied Bhavivekas and Chandrakirti's commentaries on the Muramadimika Karika and learned their different logical analysis of Nagarjuna's statements. So seventh, at the end of the lecture, I showed you the overall picture of, uh, of Patsap's classification of the Indian philosophical systems, including the Buddhist and non-Buddhist systems. He classified the Buddhist system into four main streams, as the Tibetan did later, but he also classified them from a broader perspective including non-Buddhist system, and from an ontological perspective. For him, all non madhyamaka scholastic systems are subsumed under the category of substantialist system. He adopted a Madhyamaka refutation of the uh, substantialist view from his rival Svatantrika masters, Shantarakrishna and Kamalashira. Then he has Chandrakirti reply to them using Chandrakirti's argument against Babiveka. This anachronistic procedure can be interpreted as Pazap's own challenge to the Svatantrikas. His intention was to demonstrate the superiority of his own Prasangika over the Svatantrika system. This is the conclusion of my lecture. So what can we learn from this study? Any classification, categorization, or grouping of thoughts reflects the trends of the times and individual intentions. We should keep this in mind and not, to, uh, not take any classification as fixed in actual history. So on the last page of the slide, there is a list of studies written in English uh, about Patsap Nimatak and his works. So you can download the slides, all the slides, and then PDF from our shared uh, folder. So it's, it's a, uh, quite a long lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. If you have a look closer to the Mukherjee, you don't touch me. 
Sorry? Cu 5 ani și pe tot ce mă. Ia, tu tot ce mă. Cu 5 ani și pe tot ce mă. Yeah, Tradition of Kaurita. So, because this classification, I think, according to Kunji Yachi, but it exists during the Padma Sambhava and so on. But name is created because of maybe because it was left after, but because the tradition, is, uh, according to Kunji Yachi, I say it exists during the Padma Sambhava and so on. So, because I can show you the yeah, yeah. page yeah. in Kunji Yachi. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so, so uh, some girl scholars reported uh, about the, that distinction and uh, uh, some discussions uh, yeah, whether yeah. it was uh, so by Pazap or uh, yeah. Indian creation. Yeah. yeah. Also, the the studying in South India, mm. she says that the Yeah, yeah, that, uh, so it could be yeah, that the ideas existed before Pasap. Yeah, uh, it's a it, yeah, tradition, yeah, 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 or tradition. Yeah, because uh, so, so, so we can we can realize that. So, so that the the commentators had the different interpretations, and uh, so their positions are totally different. Yeah. So, but uh, so at least the the names. Telugu Rangipa. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I wonder if one could actually do a proof if a text is really of or not. Yeah, no. Like in the way that it could do for Pazza. Uh, in this particular mm -hmm. case, because the manuscripts would be much, much later, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because but my we can get a look at this kind of references. The references is kind of a try to kind of kind of find out because it is real or not. Yeah, way to think. It's tricky. It depends on the story of your history. Yeah. Tricky, as, as we saw in this yeah. example as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what 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 I wondered is that. Uh, if the Tibetans already knew that this is an invention by Patsa, why did they maintain it? <laughs> why did they maintain it or use it? As, yeah. So it must have been convenient as a distinction. In yeah, convenient. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's true. But yeah, so then, uh, so after Patsa's time, the, the Prasangika system. Uh, yeah, became uh, much popular mm -hmm. in Tibet, and uh, so many people followed Chandra Kate or Chandra Kate is better than the Babi Beka and so on. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, Prasangika uh, is also became a mainstream mm -hmm. uh, among Tibetans. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to the speaker. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.